welcome to Strange Weekly News. In this show, we'll be taking a look into the news and headlines to pick out curious reports of the strange, weird, and mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. Each news item we go over in the show, I will put all the links to them in the description box below once this live show is over, as well as chapters on the Timeline Index. First, welcome to all my first-time viewers and listeners. I hope you find this show informative and that you'll subscribe to this channel and check out my other shows and content. Please make sure to share this video with anyone or groups or forums for those who you think will be interested because the growth of this channel has a lot to do with you, my wonderful viewers and listeners. Deranged Lunatic, thank you so much for the super sticker. Hello, Darkstar, Jonicide, my moderator. I appreciate you. Hides and Long Grass, I also appreciate you. Nature Cam, Claudia, Less Sweet, how is everyone doing today? We got Casper. We even got Jimmy Church in the house. What is going on here? Gabs, Andrew, hello, everyone. Now, before we get started, I'd like to mention the new show, The Unknown Zone, is on Mondays at 10 a.m. PST. This last Monday was on The Mysteries of the Sphinx. On Tuesday, James Fox was my guest on Shifting the Paradigm, so definitely check out those shows. Now, my co-hosts today are two of my dear friends who have been so kind and supportive since the beginning of my journey of exploring UFOs and the paranormal. And that's Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio, Micah Hanks of the Debrief Media, and of course, Puck the Puck Wedgie. Let's go ahead and bring in our incredible co-hosts for today. Micah, Jimmy... How is it going, everyone? Howdy. Jimmy, How uh, thank you so much for that super sticker. I, Wait, I, I didn't appreciate do that. that. I think you did. Man, okay. my, man, the people that work for me just think I'm just a blank checkbook. <laughs> you know, I told them, I, you know, before the show, I said I have to pay uh, Christina uh, to do the show. And, and I was just, you know, and apparently... Uh, they took that serious. So there you go. Yeah, but when they said you have to pay, they meant I, that you were gonna you were gonna have to put up with me today. So you're really gonna pay, Church. You know that? that <laughs> that's got a couple of more zeros tied on to the end of that. To be honest with you. So uh, hey, everybody, how you doing? It's uh, it's Friday. It's the end of the week. Uh, crazy breaking news all week long. Uh, the strange variety uh, just came in waves this week. Uh, lots to talk about today. Lots, lots, lots. There is so much. So let's let's begin with the elephant in the room, the delayed UFO report. So I actually just read the latest from Ross Coulthard, who said that he had heard the classified version went to Congress on October 31st. But the delay is in the redacted public version being sent to con Congress for public release. So I'd really love to hear your thoughts on what's going on. Micah, if you want to go first. I'd be happy to jump in here because, of course, the debrief team and I have been following this very closely. And uh, I think that I'm starting to already get mixed messages, um, although I, I couldn't avoid a quick joke. You know, Jimmy's saying it's been a week full of all these developments. And the one thing we didn't get yet another week without a UAP report now. Let's let's talk about why it's late, uh, presumably. The last report, I mean, there was an entirely different group behind that report. Uh, and with, with new intelligence officials, you know, with a slightly different ideological perspective, uh, I'm not surprised. In fact, I was surprised when the last report did arrive on time. And when I found out that the New York Times had, you know, quite a good bit of knowledge about what was going to be in that report, um, I guess the, the first telltale sign that this was going to go a little differently was last Friday. Uh, I was in New York and, uh, you know, the debriefs, Chrissy Newton sent me a text message. I'm on an Uber ride on my way to Brooklyn. And the message says, read this right now. And there's this report in the New York Times by Julian Barnes, who actually had co-authored an article in advance of the last ODNI report last year. Uh, Julian's take was a little different. His tone was quite different this year. Uh, and he's saying, you know, in, according to intelligence officials, we know that most of these objects are probably, and he uses some, some I would say, fairly triggering uh, phraseology for the UAP community, swamp gas. 
uh, weather balloons, uh, space aliens, things like this. And of course, rather than referring to it as UAP, not that I have a problem with that, but in the title of the article, he also says UFOs. But I, I'm a little concerned that the intention had been somewhat to kind of inflect a bit of his own view that, oh, this is all nonsense. We've all kind of suspected that. And now intelligence officials, they're getting to the bottom of a lot of this. But now in recent days, I've reached out, of course, to Pentagon spokespeople, ODNI spokespeople. The ODNI hasn't had a whole lot to say, but I got a very interesting comment uh, from Pentagon spokesperson Sue Goff. And she said, although the, the DOD is not going to comment on this report prior to its release, she more specifically said prior to its delivery to Congress. And that she told me in a correspondence yesterday. So while some are saying, well, the report was on time, but it was delivered to Congress on October 31st, Again, I'm now asking, has the actual completed classified version been delivered to Congress yet? Does that explain why it's being held up? But we want know one thing for certain right now. The public version of the report certainly has not made its way to the ODNI's page that everybody's been sitting there refreshing. So in terms of what this actual report will entail, we've also seen advanced reporting from the Daily Mail. But I got to say, guys, I appreciate everybody trying to get on the ball and get on top of this before we see the report but, I mean, we haven't seen the report. Presumably the New York Times, the Daily Mail, they haven't read this report. I'm questioning whether people on Capitol Hill have been briefed on this report yet. So, for my own part, I'm just looking forward to seeing the report. And I'm going to wait and, and withhold judgment until I've actually seen what's in it, rather than all this speculation that's been building. Jimmy, what do you think? Well, Jimmy, actually, before what you before we ask you what you think, for those that aren't familiar with this report, can you just kind of give us a brief overview of what it's supposed to contain? Uh, it well, uh, that's for me. Uh, uh, what the report? Well, you know what? I, I'm going to answer that directly, and also answer the first question at the same time. We don't know nothing. Nobody knows anything. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Ross Colthart. who has got connections and, and things, uh, Julian Barnes, eh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it, but anything, anybody that's commenting on this, um, uh, is projecting an opinion. There's, there's nobody knows anything. So nobody knows about the content of the report. When you see things like you know, from uh, the Daily Mail, of all the things, which I put right at the level of any other supermarket tabloid that you that you get next to the Reese's peanut butter cups in the checkout aisle. All right. And and so nobody at the Daily Mail in the UK of all places has has uh, leaked information to them or they've seen the report. They have it. Nobody has. Um, and so that's it. What's in the report. That's, that, that's an opinion. What's expected in the report. That's an opinion. Um, these, these comments about it's going to be blamed on Chinese drones and, and, and weather balloons and, and other, that's opinion. That's it. That's just somebody's opinion. Nothing more. We will find out when the report gets released. That's it. The one thing um, in Susan Goff's uh, reply uh, to Micah is a pretty telling one, right? You can kind of read between the lines there uh, where there is a suggestion that there's a, a classified version that uh, may have already been delivered and the unclassified version, uh, the redacted version hasn't yet. Feels like you can read that into that statement. I'm, I'm with Mike on that. But I'm, I'm saying probably not, probably not. If the if the classified version was floating around Washington D.C., again, this is my opinion, you would see leaks. <laughs> Somebody's going to be talking. Some elected official is going to make a comment. Uh, bills have been passed. Budgets are out there, um, and uh, somebody is not going to be happy about that report, um, no matter what it says. And there will be comments on it. And and quite frankly, there isn't any. So it's all opinion. What is what's not going to be in the report? E.T. is here. That's I can tell you with pretty much 100 percent certainty 
there's uh, not going to be some dramatic disclosure um, that uh, contact has been made and, and we're trying to figure th this out. I, I don't think that that is going to be in the report at all. So, and I don't want to put, you know, water uh, on this and, and dampen, you know, everybody's hopes, but uh, you know, I, I don't expect that. What, what is surprising to me and Micah, uh, you've done a lot of coverage on this. This is the point that all of us need to uh, wrap our head around and appreciate all of the sudden every intelligence agency NSA, CIA, NRO, doesn't matter. Um, every branch of the military, everything inside those five walls of the Pentagon, um, every level of the House, Capitol Hill, the White House, media, print and otherwise, has an interest in the UFO subject. So that that right there, where it has been decades of denial and and ridicule, why why suddenly the interest from everybody uh, acknowledging that there is something going on and we're trying to figure it out? That's a fact, and that is the most interesting and compelling part of all of this. Those are the really big questions, Tasaka. Thank you so much for the super sticker. Nature Cam has a question. Jimmy and Micah, do you think that the report they will downplay all the UAPs that are unexplainable and just focus on all the ones that are? What I do you add, think? I, I'll say this about that. I mean, in the pre-reporting by the New York Times, they already seem to have done that, which is one more reason, again, to come back to my earlier point and to mirror what Jimmy was just talking about. This is all speculation leading up to the actual report being produced. And again, keep in mind that if anything plays out like it has over the last few months, what will happen is um, either the briefing has occurred or it will occur. And this is important because Jimmy noted, even if we don't have leaks of information, we probably would be hearing folks on Capitol Hill talking about having received a briefing. We got a lot of that last year and for several days leading up to the actual appearance of that public version of the report. And then it was actually on time, which was almost remarkable. I mean, they really just went right down to the very last hour, quite literally. It was within the 4 to 5 yeah. p.m. hour block on a Friday for the date of delivery. But they got it there on time. I mean, everybody was sitting there refreshing. I might as well refresh here right now because I've, I'm monitoring this as we're talking. Still no report as of yet. But again, my suspicion is based on the wording that was provided to me from the Pentagon spokeswoman, and then also the lack of chatter that we're getting out of Washington, they probably haven't seen a report yet, or if they have, they weren't impressed with what they saw. Now, in terms of this forthcoming report, and whether, as the question had asked, they're going to downplay in that report, the, the unknowns and emphasize the knowns, that's always been out of the playbook. I mean, going back to Project Blue Book, they want to emphasize the fact that the military is capable of discerning what most of these things are, even in cases where there are what appear to be genuine unknowns. They're always going to say with high confidence, we know that these aren't anything exotic and that if there were more data, you know, these could be resolved too. But since many UFO sightings fall in that so-called low information zone, we can't resolve those reports. We're confident we'd be able to if we had that data. So that's always kind of been the way that the military operates. And I can't blame them. Nobody said that UFOs are an easy, uh, you know, simply resolved question. They aren't. Obviously, they aren't because for decades now, we've had this ongoing debate. And it's probably going to continue well after the publication of this report once we do see it. And probably the next several reports, I don't think, like Jimmy was saying, we're going to get any kind of extraordinary revelations about extraterrestrial life, contact, visitation, what have you. No, we're going to continue to see the military say, well, you know, there are knowns and unknowns, but we're confident that we would make them all knowns if we had more data. One final point. This much was also expressed by Sue Goff in her statement that she provided the debrief yesterday. And of course, we're going to have an official uh article all about this once the report goes out. And with all respect to the other journalists who felt like they had to jump all over this before they'd read the report, hey guys, you know, you play the hare, we're going to play the tortoise, but I'm going to wait and we're going to provide our own analysis of what they actually provide us in that report. And then I hope we all wait on the FOIA folks to go out there and, you know, push like John Greenwald has done in the past. 
then we'll get a redacted version of the classified version of that report, which may actually offer some more clues. And, you know, in fact, everybody who said that the last report from June 2021, you know, was a nothing burger, there was nothing in it. I'll say, first of all, I, dis I disagree. But also, go look at that redacted classified version. Look at the additional appendixes in the back. Look at the expansive involvement of the FBI in assisting the UAP task force. Look at the entire graphs. OK, the charts that showed the different shapes of UAP that were completely redacted. Look at the entire section about range Fowlers and every mention of that expression that had been redacted from that version before the public got the initial version we saw. There is plenty to wade through. And so, again, once we get this new report, it's going to be that process all over again. It's going to be a slow trickle for years. But again, if you know what to look at and again, if you interpret that intelligently, I think it's still going to show quite a bit for those unknowns, and there's still going to be a lot of work to done in terms of resolving those and in the broader context, understanding what that means. But I think that many who have studied UAP for a long time, they already have, speculative though it is, a pretty good idea of what the implications could be. Nature Camp, thank you so much for supporting and for asking a really fantastic question. Now, Rose has a question saying, do you think maybe the report will be released after the election? possibility i think so too i i think with the way that things are going at the moment I well today's friday right friday yeah, so i'm not gonna and, get it over the weekend and yeah. it's already uh it's three o'clock out here pacific time so what is that that's six six p.m in washington dc I, I think you know business hours are kind of closed now for something like this yeah. I, I could be wrong but uh, uh, would something like this get released on the weekend? Reports have been released on the weekend in the past uh, for various reasons. Uh, so that possibility still is, is there. But come Monday, I mean, this country is going to be very, very, very busy. Washington, D.C. It's going to be a very busy place. And I'm not so sure that UFOs are, are on the front burner. Um, but it's possible. So, yeah, it could, it could very well. Uh, push into uh, late next week. I mean, we still have to uh, we have to survive Wednesday right? as a country. We have to we have to wade our way through uh, uh, what's going to go down on Wednesday. So, I, yeah, that that's a possibility. That's a possibility. Uh, Laura says, "Puck Wedgie for president." I'd vote Absolutely. For oh, yeah, me too. I mean, look at that cute little face. Look at that cute little smile and those big ears. Thank you so much, Laura. And Jessica says, this is going to be a great show today. Thanks, Christina, Jimmy, and Micah. And look, I am with you. And I'm when this was presented, I think, what, like last month or two months ago, doing a roundtable like this once a month, I'm like, this is the best idea ever. I think bringing two of you guys in, talking about everything strange and very specifically talking about this report, I couldn't have asked for two better people. Yeah, well, you know, the three of you are great, and and I'm just happy to be along for the ride. The three of us. Thank you. I'm glad you included Puck on that one. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, uh, I'm excited um, but I've got, this is the thing. I, I haven't stopped my life for this, right? I haven't. I was very, last year, that was a, that was a different situation. And, uh, and then building up, of course, to the, uh, the congressional hearing with the subcommittee, uh, very exciting stuff this time around. I'm not stopping my life. I've, I've got things to do. And I've got some amazing potatoes that are boiling. As soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to make mashed potatoes. I'm going to make my own fried chicken. I'm going to watch a movie tonight. I'm not worried about it. We'll see. When the report comes, it comes. And, you know, or that'll be a prime rib night. But, but well, I have you to know, wait. with it coming out possibly next weekend, even on a Wednesday, you know, it, it could drop while there's just so much distraction going on in D.C., kind of be on like a, a back page news report. Mm -hmm. So I think that maybe, if anything, that might be, in their opinion, the best time to drop it because no one's going to be paying attention to it. Yeah, that's one of the things that Micah uh, has talked about uh, for for many, many years. And he's a professional journalist. I just I'm, I'm just a professional jaw flapper you know that's what i do but but micah has always uh, commented on when a story is there something else that's in front of it 
that could bury it. it you know, news cycles are, are seconds now. You, you, you remember, Mike, you know, 72-hour news cycle. Remember that? You remember? How oh, yeah. long ago? That was five years ago. And now um, it's, uh, it's a 60-second news cycle. It's a, it's a Twitter world that we live in. Mike is literally, uh, you know, sitting there with a mouse clicking refresh. That's how quick of a news cycle we're in. Right. And that's, that's not a joke. So Christina, you bring up one of the best points. Maybe it could get released on, uh, on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday when there are huge major headlines going on and, and it just gets lost, lost in the shuffle. Thursday rolls around. It's it's forgotten. It's a possibility, right, Micah? A big one. Yeah, I think my monitor's probably checked out for the weekend already. So, you know, right. the Washington aren't the only ones. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, this is the thing. Right now, the, the difference between this delivery date, and maybe there was to an extent some sort of planning. I think it's very easy to read into things when there's no intention. So let's put speculation about, you know, the intention of making it October 31st, Halloween being the delivery date. Everybody had said that might be intended to kind of insinuate that this is silly or spooky. Well, they did a great job missing that delivery date of, uh, of Halloween, you know, which the media completely would have played that up. But the likelihood of seeing this report before the forthcoming election, to your point, Jimmy, That seems highly unlikely uh, because in Washington, those kinds of things take precedence over an intelligence report on UAP. Now, again, for the rest of us who are looking at this, and and in fact, military officials who take very seriously the potential dangers that may arise from, you know, foreign surveillance platforms. I mean, any kind of unknown that is making incursions into controlled airspace, uh, you know, interrupting planned military training exercises. I mean, those are all national security challenges. And that was the actual term that they used in the last report. So it is serious. But for most politicians, you know, for most agencies in Washington, including those agencies involved with this report, is this the number one pressing concern that they're all worried the most about right now? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. And I want to stay on that point, if I may. Please. We're, I think we we could almost be in a flip-flop of the original playbook. And and what I'm saying is this. Let's go back to the 1950s, okay? Um, Micah uh, was a, a 30-year-old intrepid reporter uh, in 1955. He was, he, was, he was amazingly talented. And one of the things that they did back then is they encouraged, I'm talking about Washington, D.C., in the United States Air Force, the military, the Pentagon. They encouraged the UFO issue. They wanted people to say that, to absolutely throw off the rest of the world. We were in the middle of a very dramatic uh, uh, nuclear race. Uh, uh, We just came off of World War II, and we didn't want the Russians to know what we had, you know, technically in in the skies. Uh, Jet aircraft, these things were new things. So as long as people are reporting UFOs, let the Russians think that that's what's going on. Let the what rest of the world think that that is what is going on. Throw it off, right? But are, where, are we in a different reality today in that the report and the chatter, Bray and Mulberry and others, you know, that, that want to insinuate that it's the Chinese and the Russians with surveillance capabilities that, that are getting into our airspace. That's the opposite of what it used to be. So would we then say that it's Chinese in this report when it's not the Chinese? Think about this for a second. Now, does that throw everybody off the scent, right? Where the Chinese are back on, that, wait, we don't have that tech. Not maybe it is you. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, they're doing the little reverse. Oh, I see what's going on here. Right. So it, is it the opposite of the original playbook, but very effective? You know, when the original UAP task force report, Micah, 
we all remember it ain't the Russians. It's not foreign adversaries. It's not Chinese. And it ain't us. But we don't know what's going on. But we can definitively say this. And th those were their words. And I'm not paraphrasing. And they said, so for that, we've got an other bin. Right? Now, wait a minute. That's very carefully worded uh, stuff. It's saying stuff to our adversaries. It's saying stuff to the world. It's saying stuff to the media. Right? It's very cleverly worded. So how is it going to be worded this time when the last report was, hey, it may not have been everything to everybody, but it was very definitive in those points. Now, are we, you know, the New York Times and others are suggesting a flip-flop that they're going to paint this picture as Chinese drones. That's the exact opposite of what we just went through. So it's, it's you really have to think about this. This is a message to the world. This is a message to our adversaries, not to just the UFO community and, and the three of us here and the people that are listening to this show. It's not, it's not written for us. So you need to really think about that. And how is this playbook, you know, if it's really going to flip-flop from the flip-flop, you have to ask yourself why. Good points. These are the big questions. And uh, there are a few things I would like to bring up before we continue. First being with Matt Frost. Thank you so much. It says, late Friday report news churn to get lost in the news cycle. That is absolutely true, as we've had mentioned that just a little bit, of, just a little while ago. So if that were to come up today, this evening, it, I'd be grateful, but it wouldn't be much of a surprise. Now, Android Purity says, agree. It would have been released by now if it was going to be released before election. Also, New York Times articles is pre-gaming from Pentagon to downplay it. Thank you so much, Android Purity. And what do you guys think about his comment? Because he has another one, but for, for his first one. Well, you know, in line with what Jimmy was already saying, if you go back to the 1950s and maybe even the late 1940s, right after the Second World War, the New York Times had actually reported on some of the flying saucer craze at that time. And they'd included reports allegedly from officials who had seen a you know, mysterious disc shaped object hovering over the River Thames that had an iron cross on it. Now, again, the insinuation would uh, would seem to be that someone thought they'd seen some kind of an aerospace development that had belonged to the Nazis. Was this a true account? Probably not. Why would that have appeared in the New York Times? Because as part of the misinformation effort, not intending to mislead the United States and United States citizenry, but more importantly, the Soviets who were also reading our newspapers, the intention was to try and convey that, you know what, uh, these flying saucers that all of a sudden are all throughout the skies over North America, yeah, they were a German technology. They were potentially trying to mislead our our adversaries at the time into thinking, hey, the U.S. has some sort of a secret super weapon that they've obtained from the German scientists at the end of the war. Now, whether or not that was, you know, effective in terms of misleading the Soviets and causing them to be concerned about what the U.S. might have had in its arsenal, anybody's guess. But again, to Jimmy's point right there, in the last report, and again, having spoken to some extent, the debrief team and I, with some of those who were involved with collection of the data for that report, they all seem very honestly interested in the phenomenon. They seem to think that there were some good cases. Uh, they were very interested in trying to use data to resolve some cases, but based on the way that they viewed the data that was collected on those quote unquote good cases, and we're not just talking about the Nimitz incident from 2004, although that one remains, even in Julian Barnes reporting from last Friday, that one is continuously referenced as being one of those cases we can't really resolve. Again, the, the point seemed to be that those officials working on that report were saying, look, we're going to be honest with you. There, there's something, there's probably several somethings, and we're trying to resolve them. The tone, based on the, uh, uh, the pre-reporting by the Times and other agency or uh, outlets, seems to indicate that right now, like Jimmy's saying, they might be saying, okay, we've got these unknowns. How can that information be used to stir the pot a little bit, to misdirect away from what the U.S. does know and doesn't know, and more importantly, to do so to give us a strategic advantage against our enemies. That makes total sense because going back to the 40s and 50s, it's been done before. 
It has. It has. You're totally right. Android has another question. And thank you again. It says, why do you three think the average American still has no clue the Pentagon admitted they have chased UFOs with their jets? Who wants Jimmy answer that one first? That happens every single day. <laughs> I mean, that happens. As every Ryan Graves day. says, "Yeah." Yeah, I mean that 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 happens every single day. Uh, so, could or should or would uh, a branch of the military out of the Pentagon comment every single day about you know chasing um, some some object you know in in the sky? Would they do that? no no? I don't think they would comment it, uh, on it at all unless a civilian saw it and, you know, saw the incursion and reported on it and then would force the Pentagon to respond. But as far as uh, the, you know, what goes on with daily activities uh, with the service branches around the world, you know, we're talking about millions of service members uh, on, on on bases all around the world, it would just be impossible. So I, nah, you know, uh, look, Micah is, uh, uh, not only does he run the debrief, well, t t Tim answers to Micah, but that's not for public knowledge. But here's the thing. Micah uh, is dealing with the military every single day. And Micah, would you expect uh, the Pentagon, any branch of the military, to give us constant updates of pilots chasing something around the world? No. And in fact, they're going to say as little as they can, whenever they can, however they can. Uh, you know, again, I, I was amazed that there was a complete statement, although I think it had to do with the way that I asked the question that Sue Goff got back with me. But she's always been very forthcoming uh, in my experience. Uh, and I, I feel that the first thing you should try to always do is show respect for people in the military, even if you have concerns with the way that some of their policies uh, or, or procedures or, or the bureaucratic element in Washington relays that information to the public. But again, uh, I think being polite certainly is a success strategy. But in those correspondences that I have, these people are people just like us and they're doing a job and they're going to tell you what they have been told that they can tell you. And they will say, this is how you can say it and what you're to attribute to me. And here's how to actually say uh, you know, me, my title and and what's been conveyed to you in both instances. When I reached out to the Pentagon and to the ODNI in advance of this report, even though I was trying to ask questions about what other officials had already said and was already being reported by other outlets like the New York Times, their response was essentially, here's what we can say, here's what we can't say, and I have nothing else for you or I have no guidance for you on that other question. So, again, to your point, Jimmy, and no, they, they won't say it if they can avoid saying it or if they've been directed not to. And when it comes to all the knowns and the unknowns, you know, pilots chasing UAP and all these kind of things, there's not going to be a press release written every time one of those incidents occurs. In fact, if anything, they're, they're going to try to say as little about that as, po as possible in every instance, as we saw in the last report. That last report. There were no specifics on any of those 144 incidents, except for the description of the deflating balloon that they say they ruled out. And even that, even that was vague, right? They never said that that was the resolved case. You had to, you know, you had to put that one together yourself. They never came out and said the one case was a weather balloon. No, they said that they resolved the case as a weather balloon and there was 144, 143, you know, and so you had to. Uh, you know, place those puzzle pieces on the table yourself and, and figure that out. There was, I wanted to bring this up two days ago, press conference and world affairs, right? Okay. So, uh, I, you know, general press conference and uh, I, f I forget the reporter for some reason, eh, eh, I want to say it was MSNBC, but I could be wrong. Anyway, Report it back in the room. So, uh, do you have any comment on uh, the, the the UFO UAP report that is, uh, you know, and uh, you know, and if uh, there's another part uh, about this possibly being Chinese and Chinese drones, right? And I was like, man, you you go right, okay, here we go. And you know what the the spokesperson, spokeswoman, spokesperson, she goes just like this, Micah, on all that. I need a book. 
Oh, I don't have a book. <laughs> she's got the three ring binder, right? And she's listening. She flips through the binder. He gets to the end of the question. She goes, well, I've got nothing to say. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you see it? I didn't see that one. But <laughs> uh, When I do have something to say, I'll get back to you. She had nothing. In, she wasn't prepared. Didn't know what the question was about. It wasn't in the three ring binder. And it was that, you know, that, that boiler plate. Ah, I'll get back to you when I got something. Yeah. And that was, that was two days ago. Well, but again, that's why they have briefing cards. And, you know, again, you know, John Greenwald and others have actually FOIA'd the briefing cards that are used to generate those talking points. So when you see, you know, the White House press secretary up there and they're answering questions for the press, they may speak on certain points, but they have briefing cards that outline what is known, what can be said and what cannot be disseminated to the press. Those are the quotable portions. And again, this is all completely control of the message. I mean, this is that's entirely what this is. I, don't, I would I would hesitate to call that propaganda, uh, but it is uh, controlling your image and our government, all governments throughout time, throughout all history, going all the way back to Alexander the Great, have always been great at doing that. They want to present their best face, and that's the way you do it. And again, I can't blame them, but that's going to limit always the level of information and uh, you know the granular detail that you can expect in these cases. Yeah, that's right. Micah, can I ask you a question? I'm going to ask Christina the, the same question, but I'm going to ask you first. <laughs> All right. You got a choice, right? You can make this decision. The decision is on you. Okay. Okay. Aliens visiting Earth or Chinese drones crossing into our airspace. And and it, it you you get to make the choice. Okay, you hate it when I do this, but I've got to quick qualifiers. I'm talking about the unknowns that exhibit the characteristics That's described. Not the question: Aliens invading Earth, visiting Earth, or I mean, what's more dangerous? What's more scary to Micah Hanks? Oh. Aliens or Chinese drones invading U.S. airspace. Oh, so your question is, which of those two is more frightening to me? Well, you and you, you get to make the choice of what it is. What? Is, what where do you go? If, if your question is, as I understand it, if that's which is more frightening of those two, I would have to say I would go with the unknown only because it is unknown. We don't know what. I didn't say are. unknown. I said aliens visiting Earth or Chinese drones. Invading our airspace. Yeah, that's not really a question, though, Church. What is your question? You have, a, you have a choice. You have a choice. And I have to pick one. Yeah, that's right. I just have to pick one just for funsies? What would you rather have? Oh, man. I mean, it's tough because we don't know what the intentions of the extraterrestrials would be. That's political. It's political. It's a political answer. I'll answer for Micah. He's chicken. I'm not chicken, but I'm trying to measure carefully all potentials here, Church. Look, yeah, you'd rather ahead. have aliens visiting this planet. Look, that, that is less of a threat. Proceeding with the with the logic that the intelligence behind a technology that could bring them here would have to be so sophisticated that their intentions would be beyond you know, the kind of mortal concerns of earthlings and our disputes over land and resources, I would have to think that their intentions would be greater than a hostile nation invading the United States. So I'm going with aliens. Christina, what's more threatening to you? I, I'm going to agree with Micah on that's this right. one. That's right. And that's the play. So if you want the answer... Right. With this UFO report, you know, Vegas is going to say, you know what I mean? It's 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 going to be Chinese. It's going to be adversarial. How times have changed. Right. How much uh, we understand not only ourselves, but the universe and the implications of that and and life out there and intelligent life. Uh, all of the alien, you know, Independence Day. Great movie. Scared the crap out of us, but we won in the end, right? Okay. So anyway, 
Um, but we don't look at ET like that. We're more scared of a Chinese drone. And that's 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 bizarre. And that's the strange world uh, that we live in. Well, so because that- it's it's defined as a UAP threaten kind of flight safety and it's a possible national security right if you're looking at it at the more military mindset yeah that's terrifying more so than aliens in in some respects now if you were to ask your average person this question they're going to go ahead and say probably extraterrestrials are a little bit more scary because as micah had mentioned they're still classified as the unknown we don't know their motives we don't know really how they got here we don't really understand their craft therefore because it's unknown it's frightening just like the dark yeah, yeah, i can i can i can see that i can see that but i don't agree with it i totally <laughs> see your i hear you it, it it's it's an extremely valid point but I would think that, especially the younger generation that has been dealing with, you know, from the age of two, um, invaders in, right, and and alien invasions, and oh, and and movies, and and propaganda, and and all of that, the Marvel universe, what have you. I don't, I, you know, I don't think everybody uh, these days perceives it uh, as a threat because if if it if it was a threat, I think we would know by now. Right. And and it, 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 we're too easy. Um, uh, Isaac Arthur. I love Isaac Arthur. He's he's uh, aside from Micah Hanks. He's like the smartest person that I know. OK. And, and I say that in, in all seriousness. But Isaac said uh, one one thing to me that I've I've never forgotten. He goes, uh, Jimmy, it's not. It's not pulse weapons. It's not laser beams. It's 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 none of that. If ET wanted to take over this planet or, or destroy it or do anything, they would approach Earth at the speed of light, come into the solar system, pump the great uh, pump the brakes and dump their garbage. Huh. That's what they would do. And they're, they don't need a weapon. They would pummel our planet with garbage, right? <laughs> Moving at the speed of light. And, uh, and that would be the end of it. it. You know, it wouldn't be misdirecting an asteroid, you know, a virus, a disease, androids, you know, landing and taking over with artificial intelligence. Nah, it's too much work. Dump your trash. <laughs> right. And and that hasn't happened. You know, it's a it, it's a it's a very, very easy thing to do. We're a very primitive planet. And uh, uh, coming here, uh, we're not going to band together as tribes, uh, you know, in in the in the forest above Seattle in the mountains. You know, what what, what was a uh, 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 red alert? What was that movie? Uh, what was that movie? Uh, with the Badgers, oh. uh, uh, Red Dawn, Red Dawn. We're what? not, yeah, we're not going. You know, we're not going to get together with with you know pistols and bows and arrows and and band together and and start shooting at alien ships and and figure out how to get this done. No, it it just wouldn't be that kind of party. So if it hasn't happened, it's not going to happen. What? I don't know. Life is full of surprises, but we have quite a few super chats to go through. So let's go through those and then we can continue. Journals, thank you so much. Lavera, I appreciate it. Brian, you know that's right. Thank you so much. Christy says, my first thought, I wonder if the report was turned into the ODNI, but sent back because it didn't meet the criteria, knowing Congress would be livid by a report walking back what they've already admitted. That's an interesting thought. What do you guys think about that? It's something yeah, that you, I considered. That's a very smart audience uh, that you have here, uh, Christina. That that that's actually a very good point. Um, but um, it, it's ODNI that's creating the report, though, right? Correct. The report yeah. isn't being turned into the ODNI. The ODNI is running the committee um, and it's coming out of the ODNI's office. But the second part of the, the question is, 
you know, of doing a flip flop, right? Are they going to have to walk this back? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time, you know, that's for sure. Well, Micah, here's uh, let me ask you this: by the time a report goes through the filters. Right. It's going through levels. It's going, you know, it's passing across that and, and things are being verified and vetted and checked and what can be released and what is it and 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 the grammar um, and certainly who the report is speaking to. It's not just to the United States. Right. This is a this is a world report. This is going uh, for everybody's eyes. Right. By the time it gets to the release stage. It it it's been it's been filtered, right? I don't think there would be anything to walk back at that point. No, I mean, imagine the amount of eyes had to look at it before it was even released to Congress. So I think what Christy said and also what you said, Jimmy, are both valid points. Nature Cam, thank you so much. It says, Micah, can you please answer the next question in Jimmy's voice? Hashtag impressions, because we all know you do it so well. And for the new viewers and listeners that haven't heard you do it, please indulge us just a little. Well, depends on what the next question is. Okay, well then go ahead, go ahead and read this next super chat, okay, Matt. Thank I have you a so video. Much. Uh, Micah doesn't know this. I'll send it to you later, Micah. <laughs> I have a video uh, from uh, on the set of uh, my new TV show, and Micah is a guest. And I caught Micah imitating me with with some people on the set, <laughs> <laughs> but I videotaped it. And it was it, it was pretty fun, man. I got to tell you, Micah, <laughs> it was pretty funny. Do you remember doing it? Uh, oh yeah, I do. I, I always remember my impersonations, especially my favorite impersonations. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you hear somebody. I mean, I know he's sitting right here, but you got to ask me. You got to ask. You know, if if you can talk to the person you want me to impersonate. So let me put these cans on. And then uh, Christina, no, it'll be funnier if Jimmy does it. Jimmy, I want you to ask, can we speak to Jimmy? Mike, is Jimmy home? Man, I don't know. I, I, I'll have to check. Look, bespoke radio for the masses. Yeah. All right. Great show lined up tonight. We got Linda Moulton Howe coming up. <laughs> and that dark moon coffee. I like mine dark. I haven't actually gotten my deep quite as well today because i've been talking so much but <clears throat> yeah you know if I, if I could just turn my base up i'd almost be there <laughs> thank you Micah, bespoke, for, for... bespoke radio for the masses there the, now i'm starting to get it a little better there we go okay look mike you, you, Micah, you know you're one of the smartest guys i've ever talked to in my life really really me yeah you yeah, yeah. Let, let, let me finish the question okay all right all right <laughs> god he's Okay, <clears throat> I think that's all the Jimmy I've got to. <laughs> oh my gosh, the the accuracy oh, gosh, is I was laughing so hard. incredible. Um, Matt I says, mute. "I had to mute. I had to mute." Can I can I say this, Christina? Um, I I don't know who uh, posted that question, but it was awesome. Thank that you, Cam. Micah and I are are very very close, and and I tease him a lot, and he teases me a lot. Um, but uh, we've uh, you know we just came off an amazing weekend together, and. And as I rounded the corner, he was, uh, we, you know, let's meet outside. And um, he's walking around the corner of the hotel. I'm coming out. There we were. And and that greeting between two friends uh, was was real. And I'm not going to say anything more than that. Um, you better not. I, yeah, I, I'm not going to talk about your socks. I, I'm not going to do that. Not 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 now. But. But we're friends, and and Micah makes me laugh. Um, and, and, and it and it shows really on hard. camera every single time that you guys chat, and I I love having the both of you on, and that's how Jimmy and I met. It was because of Micah. Matt Frost says, "Dark Forest Theory is what scares me the most." I'm. Do you know what Dark Forest Theory is? Dark Forest Theory. 
I don't know what that is. It was like a brand of chocolate or something. That sounds like a snazzy brand of chocolate, but I imagine like dark chocolate. And so, Matt, if you can explain what that is, I would appreciate I it. I and thank you. Gummy bears. I think so it's much. gummy bears. I think it's gummy bears. I think dark forest gummies, but not dark forest theory. Dan um, James okay. says, if this report is just full of obfuscation, it is it not time to push the UN to pick up the baton? People forget this is a world issue, not just a US one. Jimmy, you you kind of touched on that. And I agree with, with Dan here. It's a really good point. Because when it comes to the United States, when it, com when it comes to this UFO report, they're kind of an example for the rest of the country. And mm -hmm. while that can sound a little arrogant, mm -hmm. which it does, mm -hmm. it there, there is some truth behind that. So I, a, a ton of truth behind. Look at the three of us. Four. Four. Oh, yeah. Okay. Look at the four of us. Couldn't be any more different. Right? Couldn't be. And, and so if somebody didn't know about planet Earth, right, and they look at these four species here, right, they wouldn't know necessarily that we were from the same planet. Right, we look we look completely different. Hold on. But Hold here, on. On, yeah, here, right on. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Hold on. I'm going to put my jacket on. Um, <laughs> but we are all Earthlings. This is an Earth issue. It's a it's an Earthling issue. It, it, that's it. It can't be any more. Uh, Dan uh, brings up. <laughs> Look who's calling me. Should I pick up the phone? Well, you get an excellent debrief, by the way, about the latest with the Wilson memo. <laughs> I, I just got that debrief from from Melinda. In fact, I did. Did you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna embarrass her and and uh, bring her live on the air. But anyway, um, here's. But you know, and that's uh, Dan. Uh, Dan is from Australia. You know, and outside of the United States, they haven't lost sight of the fact that it's there's an international community out there. There's a whole other planet. Here in the United States, we've lost completely lost sight of that. We just we're so American centric. Totally. Right? And and we we just don't get that. Um, this UAP task force, you know, treating it like this is a, a, a US issue and a US security issue. So world issue, period, you know, and, and the rest of the world needs to be involved with this. And when ET gets here, I don't, I don't want to embarrass the people of earth with having to explain to ET, well, we've got different religions we're killing each other over. We've got borders that we're killing each other over. We've got skin color that we're killing each other over. We've got issues, sports teams we, we kill each other. You know, I mean, that doesn't, it just doesn't compute. ET needs to get here and visit earthlings, right? The people of earth. You know, why, why would we have interest in another planet that was like us? It would turn us off. Right? <laughs> They're doing what? They're fighting over borders? I thought the planet was called ABCXYZ. Uh, you, you mean they're still fighting over religion and skin color and, 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 and borders and thoughts and, and killing each other over jokes and comedy? What, what's, what's going on? No, we'll wait until they grow up. That's where we are. This is an earth issue. You know, Jimmy, I, I know we're spending a lot of time, Christina, on this UAP issue, but I mean, this is a big story right now. There's a lot to say about it. So don't let us completely steamroll. But, uh, but I do want to add something, Jimmy, you and I spent a lot of time a few weeks back talking about, you know, what hypothetical probes that came to earth, not those probes, quit that. No, I mean, you know, probes from extraterrestrial civilizations dispersed throughout the galaxy, you know, having, you know, traversed interstellar space, you know, should one make its way to Earth, what might be we expect? And, you know, some of the popular motifs that have been proposed, uh, you know, uh, John von Neumann and the so-called Neumann probe, a self-replicating artificially intelligent probe that can make its way through space, yep. harvest 
materials from you know minerals, asteroids, and, and things like this uh, replicate itself, produce others, and then they can continue to disperse and perhaps do so indefinitely, almost like a virus throughout space. But then you get the uh, you know Ronald Bracewell's idea about a Bracewell probe, the idea that a probe placed at a Lagrange point encircling a planet might observe what's happening on a planet and kind of wait to a point where that civilization that it's observing gets to a point of technological sophistication and perhaps we might say even conscious evolution where they begin to get beyond the the sim the, the you know the very simple baseline differences that we perceive superficially as being the things that divide us and if that bracewell probe picks up on those kinds of things and they begin to see okay this civilization is intelligent they they're finally beginning after millions of years to get along right they are they're exhibiting technology that is capable of reaching the stars but also now they're you know uniting harmoniously in a united effort to do that for the first time in their history and then contact is made again it very well may be the case that the criteria for contact is not just intelligence by our own measure but in it, it's it's a measure of development even beyond intelligence you know emotional intelligence empathy you know these kinds of things it could very well be that they aren't going, they may be very well aware of us. They may be here and they may be operating on earth for all different kinds of reasons. Some of the UAP very well may be in a, in a roundabout way, the very von Neumann probes and the Bracewell probes that have been hypothesized in, in a limited fashion in the past. It may be much more complex, but in, in principle, they may be the same thing and they may be keeping their distance from us for those very reasons. They may be waiting until humans are going to be less antagonistic toward each other and certainly thereby presumed to be less antagonistic toward another intelligence if one presents itself to us. But again, all, all data, all indications, Hynek, going back to Hynek, he said in those close encounter cases where occupants are observed, they seem to be by their body language, their actions, and everything else conveying primarily one thing, leave us alone. Mm-hmm. That's right. And uh, Micah, it's exactly what we are doing. We've got perseverance, right? We, uh, the, the first helicopter, the first flying right? uh, ingenuity, uh, uh, Pioneer 10, 11, Voyager uh, 1 and 2. Um, how many uh, probes? Uh, we just crashed one into Mercury, you know, last year. How many things have we sent out into the solar system? Mariner. You know, I could go on and on and on. What are we doing? We're trying to figure out what's going on. That's what we're doing. We're looking for signs of life, right? We're doing that with Europa, right? And with Ceres. We're out there trying to find these things. And now we've got uh, the James Webb Telescope. Right, looking for biospheres and looking for signs of life. That's exactly what we are doing. Is the Perseverance rover, right? Is it armed and dangerous? Is it set up to shoot to kill? No. It's just out there trying to discover stuff. So why would we expect something different, you know, from ET? And while why, we're looking why would we expect out expect something different. Uh, the, a von Neumann probe, self-replicating. I think these are uh, one of the simplest uh, things to do. And once you achieve a certain level of uh, technical awareness, that's the first step. We just, I mean, 3D printing is brand new. As a matter of fact, electricity is brand new. A hundred years ago, we still had covered wagons in Chicago, right? <laughs> we had gas lamps, man. You know, this is all, uh, uh, we, we've really lost sight of, we think that how smart we are. Um, the universe is a big place. It's 95 billion light years across. It's 38, uh, it's 18, 13.8 uh, 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 billion years old, Right. The universe is a big place. 95 billion light years across. Do you know how far we have gone from our planet? Good question. We barely just made it outside the neighborhood. Like, yeah, like, not, like a, not like far a, enough. A minute, two seconds. 
<laughs> it it seems like that. And even though and even though we are exploring space to the the way that we are, there are still people that are having experiences right here on our planet. And there was one rather recently that took place in California. Jimmy, your your home state practically. And I'd like to get into that and kind of oh, hear your thoughts on the, it. Uh, the the Azusa. Yeah, that one. But first, yeah. Arrange Lunatic, thank you for becoming a member. And Matt Frost explains what Dark Forest is, and it's lacking assurances. The safest option for any species is to annihilate other life forms before they have a chance to do mm. the same. And I think that when that comes to humanity, it's pretty accurate. No, so I, I do that on my street. Oh, I live on Dark Forest Lane. <laughs> Dang. Well, Matt and Derange Lunatic, thank you so much for supporting the channel. So this this encounter that took place in California was written um, on the New Fork website. And it was on, very specifically, it was October 3rd, so about a month ago now. And the the person that saw this, he is remaining anonymous, but he went into detail that he saw this craft between, like, 9 to 11 p.m. And he described the shape as being a diamond shaped, that there was an aura or haze around the object and the object emitted other objects, which is, is a reoccurring theme. And I think that we've all come across and he writes in his post, it says, I went hiking with two pets dogs last night, October 3rd, 2022, and I arrived from 9 p.m. and around 11.30 p.m. into our walk. A dark object was hovering above the mountainside next to me. At the first sight of it, I thought that it may have been some kind of platform recently installed on top of the hill. But as I walked closer and my angle of view changed, I could see the object was in midair. My pets weren't acting any different, and I stopped walking in confusion to what I was seeing. Shortly after, a basketball-sized orb of light came out from the ship and approached me so close I could feel the light's energy like static pulling my hair or my skin on my face. When it noticed I was scared, it seemed like the light orb got dull, and I suddenly wasn't scared anymore and began emitting heat at this moment as it was trying to warm me and I could now feel warm air all around me. Shortly after it was over, the orb wasn't there anymore and the floating object wasn't there anymore either. And the time was now almost 2 a.m., so he was experiencing missing time and it states, I don't remember the object flying away and I don't remember the orb going back to the floating object. I immediately walked back to my car with my pets and left. And then he states, I think I might have been taken into the craft or simply examined by the orb. I would like to have more information because this experience changed my life. And it seems that with a lot of people that have UFO sightings, there are two reoccurring themes. Well, several, actually, more than two. One, he experienced missing time. Two, this orb or this craft was intelligent. It was able to feel its emotions, or at least how this man attempts to explain that. And then after he had this experience, his life was changed forever. His, his perspective on the world is no longer the same because it makes you ask those really big questions that all of us are asking every single day amongst ourselves, right? Is, are we alone? And for us, we would say no. But for your average person... That are, that are kind of more in their like 40s and onward, they might say otherwise if you attempt to speak to someone at the grocery store. But when you hear this story, Jimmy and Micah, what do you guys think about? I'm going to jump in first. I'm going to jump in first. I'm going to step on Micah. Go for it. Step on Micah. Hey, you've gone first for the entire show. Is this, here's, here's, here's what's nuts. This is in my neighborhood. Okay. That's the first thing that I noted here. Azusa, there's just a hill right here from my, my side yard that separates me from Azusa. Um, Azusa is next to Pasadena. Okay. So, it, and now uh, a couple things of note uh, that uh, I found interesting. I'm going to get to Azusa specifically, though, uh, quickly here. 
I think there was a comment in there that his dogs didn't react. That was weird, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I found that uh, I, out of everything there, the orb, the thing, the missing time, right, what it looked like, the diamond shape, and he thought it was a platform, and or she, he, um, and as he got closer, it, it, it wasn't, uh, I just said he again, as they got closer, um, it wasn't a platform, it wasn't a structure, it was something that was floating. Okay, so all of that, but uh, the animals didn't react. And that that caught my eye. Very interesting part of this that for me, I raise an eyebrow and go, I think that there's something here. This is a, an experience uh, that that seems like it was a real one. But now let's 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 talk specifically about Azusa. Azusa, there's a long line of cities. There's a mountain range. I'm above the mountain range. Then San Gabriel Mountains are here. There's a there's a line of cities. They all touch each other. Um, but it's Glendale, it's uh, Pasadena, it's Monrovia, Arcadia, Azusa, right? So when you're driving up the freeway there, these cities are just divided by uh, name only and streets, right? There isn't big chunks of land. Y you know what I mean? There's nothing geographically uh, separating the uh, terrain. Um, so Azusa is just this tiny little bedroom community um, uh, north of the 210 freeway. But here is the interesting part. Where Azusa is, or anywhere here in Southern California in this area, it's against the mountains. And once you are into those mountains, it's completely remote. The mountains aren't big, but they're just there. On the other side of the mountains, right on the other side, Mojave Desert, Edwards Air Force Base, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, Air Force Plant 42, NASA, and any other thing that you want to talk about when it comes to aerospace research. Raytheon, right? It's all right there. The radar cross-section testing centers, all of that is right over the hill. You could take the road, and it drops you off on the other side minutes later into the Mojave Desert. So why would this be significant? Two reasons. One, as you wander up into the Azusa Canyons right there, um, it's very remote, and it is a great spot for a contact experience. You're alone. There's nothing up there. It's remote. That's number one. Number two, it's a great spot for E.T. to be checking out stuff. Because it's all high-tech, man. It is the high-techiest of the high-tech right there in Azusa. Number three, could it be some of our tech? I'm just saying, this is the area, and this is what Azusa is, and, and it represents. So I was very, very interested in, in the location, in the story, and certainly about the pets not reacting. Um, very, very, very interesting. But that's Azusa. That's where I live. This is a high-tech world. You saw the video that I posted yesterday. There's crazy stuff in the skies here uh, all the time. And a lot of it is largely unexplained. And the part that you can explain is high-tech stuff that's uh, being tested in the skies. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much, O'Ryan, for the super chat and for supporting the channel. It says, I have evidence that World War II was an adrenochrome harvest in trade for technology. Um, I don't know anything about that, but thank what? you so much um, for supporting the channel. Now, Micah, what do you think about this story that we just covered? Yeah, you know, the there, there are some, there are some weird out. factors. No, there are some weird factors in this story that took place on October 3rd in California. What yeah. do you think about it? Well, there certainly are. You know, uh, recently I was out there giving a lecture at the International UFO Congress in Mesa, Arizona. And one of the other, the other speakers who I've interviewed him in the past, but we'd never had an opportunity to meet was Dr. Michael P. Masters, who is the author of a few books now. But the first one that really kind of came out on the scene had been called Identified Flying Objects. And his um, explanation for some UAP is what he, I think, would term the extra tempestrial phenomenon or hypothesis, which involves essentially a time travel component. 
And uh, Mike, super cool guy, by the way. I mean, we, we got together, we had a drink and hung out a good bit at the conference, just a wonderful person. But when I was sitting there listening to his lecture, um, you're talking about Mike Schratt. No, no, Mike Masters, Michael oh, P. Mike Masters. Masters. Yeah, of course, of course, of yeah. course. Well, Mike Schratt was there too. Finally, got yeah. to meet him as well. Anybody named Mike, <laughs> pretty fun to hang out with. Yeah, yeah, especially in UFOs. But no, Mike <laughs> Masters, when he was giving his lecture, I mean, first of all, the guy is so chill and so subtly hilarious with the things that he says, uh, which in interviews, including when I'd spoken with him in the past, that didn't really come across as much as it did on stage. But when you're there with him, he is hilarious. Uh, but man, some of his use of language and his ideas are profound. And something that he pointed out that I thought was really interesting was how in a lot of UAP encounters, and I'm going to come back to the, the relevance to the one from October 3rd here in a moment, but in a lot of the UAP encounters, we hear about things like unusual, almost anomalous uh, grass growth or even tree ring growth that seems to show a sudden, you know, I guess the way we would generally interpret it would be an anomalous sudden increase in growth rate. But Mike looked at that and said, could it possibly be that what we are actually seeing has something to do with a distortion in time where the growth rate didn't increase, but as a result of a distortion in time, more growth occurred in a localized area than one, what one would expect. Now, in this instance, with the case that we were looking at here, I, I, again, I got to harken back to what Mike was, uh, you know, talking about. Even if UAP aren't time travelers per se. If their technology in some way actually warped space and thereby also had effects temporally on, on time within localized areas, could that account for some of the things like what we just, what we see described here? Again, the witness says that they felt that they had missed time, and although they had no waking recollection of being taken on board a craft or anything, they nonetheless couldn't account for what appeared to be a, long, a lengthier passage of time than what they recalled in their, in their waking memory. Two ways to interpret that would be the trope from within, you know, UFO literature involving abductions. Many people describe missing time. Not all people who describe missing time describe abductions. I think that in many cases where people do describe abductions, we could make an argument that some of those abductions are less likely to inhabit the reality that we all know, whereas in, in other cases... I mean, it seems pretty obvious that something happened to people. There were effects where, you know, there were incisions or something made, you know, that was left as a remnant on their body that was detectable thereafter and indicative of an actual experience involving some kind of an examination or what have you. Right. Those cases, though, in my view, are fairly rare. And so could we account for some of the missing time incidents related to UAP through another mechanism? Maybe Mike proposes something uh, very, very worthwhile for consideration. And, and that could be consistent with what we see in this case. So I found that interesting because if we're talking about a technology that's capable of reaching, let's say it is extraterrestrial and that it's much more advanced than we are. And they really do come from another star system. You know, our physicists, our astronomers can't wrap their heads around a technology that would get us from point A to point B. And trying to do it with rockets is increasingly difficult. And even if you get, again, i got to give a quick nod to Chris Plain, our lead science writer there at the debrief. He and MJ Benias did a great piece this week that looks at the, the key current theories right now that could enable faster than light travel. You know, even with the most advanced concepts that we have currently working, we can't account for really conceivably getting from point A to point B in a practical sense. And if we had a technology that could do that, it would stand to reason that in addition to having a very unique relationship, we might say, to space, time, gravity, and all these kinds of things, gravity being something that we experience every day. I mean, I experience it, you know, every single day when I drop something and, and I break a glass in my kitchen or whatever. And yet we can't fully explain that. But I mean, to have a, a mastery over space travel would really require that. And again, the continuity between space and time certainly might entail that some of the phenomena that we observe, if, and that's still a big if, but if they do represent an advanced extraterrestrial technology, there would be the space component. We always focus on that, but there would almost inevitably have to be a kind of time component too. So I wonder about cases like this and if that's not representative of that temporal component. Yeah, but here's the thing. And you're absolutely right. 
and and it's tough for me to comment with somebody that's got so much more intellect than I do, but I'm going to make this point. All right. Here's the deal. And this is where um, most intelligent people, especially with professional letters after their name, have got it wrong. All right. And I've, I've, I'm not a PhD. I'm not a physicist. I play one on the radio. Is this. 200 years ago, 200 years ago, the thought of waking up at midnight and sneaking out of the house and going 25 miles to get a double cheeseburger and a chocolate shake and getting back home in bed while it's still warm in 30 minutes is black magic voodoo. Yeah. The thought of that, just, 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 just just, try saying that to somebody 200 years ago, right? Today, I did it last night. I did it last night, man. (laughs) The Wendy's. Got me a Dave's Double, order of fries, yeah. all chili, frosty, right? Got home, that yellow chili sauce, that liquid melted butter, white crap that they give you that tastes so good, right? Burger's still hot. It, 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 we, we do, I did that last night. You know why? Because you can. Yep. It's easy. It's not black magic voodoo. So traveling... From one galaxy to another, forget about traveling across the Milky Way, from going from one galaxy to another, ain't nothing. It's it's the same thing as going to the -the jack-in-the-box drive-thru to get two $1 tacos, right? That's some black magic stuff. That's crazy. But E.T. does it because they can it's like nothing. And so we're trying to put all of this complexity into it. Folding space. It's faster than light. Einstein said space, time, bending, the fabric. We can't. Wait, wait, wait. He doesn't. No. No, man. They jump in the car and hit the go button on the GPS and do it. And they get back home. Before the burger's cold, right? <laughs> that, that's, it's that simple. Wait, Sorry, there, John Lear, and your dark hypothesis, it isn't blood there after it was burgers all along. Yeah, it was burgers all along, man. I know, it was burgers all along. And, and, and that simply is my point, that um, we, uh, we have a very limited scope of science, of technology, of math. It's very limited. It's very limited. We have 300 years of science behind us. That's it. That's it. 300 years. 400 if you really want to push it back to Copernicus, right? (laughs) That's all we got. You know, real, real science, real science, 50 years. You know, you want to, you want to go back to 1905 and Einstein? Okay. 115 years. What is that? It's nothing. And so uh, this, this idea, this concept of a Tesla electric car going to a restaurant that's got a microwave oven in it? What? Yes, uh, exactly. That's pretty crazy. That's that pretty crazy. Black magic voodoo Gandalf wizard stuff. You know, oh my God. Carlson well, out of it now. All right. Well, you know, it's talking, <laughs> no, it's talking about food and like, and just crazy voodoo. I have these uh, ghost pepper noodles. Take a look at these. Oh my gosh. I want to be brave and attempt to try them a little bit later. I had them on my desk for today's show. Micah, have you seen the videos of people eating spicy noodles, these contests? Have you seen? You gotta you gotta you gotta jump on TikTok, man. Yeah, you gotta go on TikTok. Get 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 hip. 
Okay. It's a thing. It's a thing. Oh. Watching these people drop dead. They got the ghost pepper noodles. <laughs> oh, well, that's entertainment right there. It's what I've been missing my whole life. <laughs> yeah, watching people suffer while they eat food. Hold that up again, Christina. Let me see that. This is uh, a spicy chicken flavored ghost pepper. They're black noodles. Uh, when I saw them, I'm like, uh, yes, that just I am looks buying. Scary. That, that 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 scares the crap out of me right there. This is why I never get sick. I would taste it like this. I'd be little, <laughs> little mouse. Yeah, I would little. But see, that would also be considered black magic, having instant noodles two hundred years ago black and magic. just putting that boiling is, water. That is some voodoo doll black magic, crazy. It 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 it's insane. But you know, you have to look at it like that. Um, e. T. When. Um, and I, I, I joke about this a lot, but we put so much into math and algorithms and string theory and and the quantum this and the measurement of that and and strong and weak gravity and all this you know and, and it's just a numbers game, right? You know, part of me says that when ET gets here and Micah and all of his PhD buddies are going to be trying to show off the math that we got, right? And ET's going. Eh. We gave up on numbers a long time ago, man. It's, yeah, we're all spiritual machines. Yeah, yeah, with, with, uh, math doesn't work for us. It's not what we do. It's not how we got here. That that's you know we think that we we have this whole elevated you know knowledge filled brain thing going on right now. No, the answer is no. Jim, et I is et is getting here FTL uh, because it's fun and easy. Here's Not the other thing Luke, I gotta say real quick. Look, we've talked about this before, but I, you know, I, I wonder sometimes when ET finally arrives here on Earth, and they do drop down on the White House lawn, and they, you know, introduce themselves and they put the babble fish on so that they can communicate, and we're like, wow, we always knew you guys were here. You know, the UFOs that we'd been seeing, and they'll look at us and they'll say, oh. So you have those two. Those weren't us. Yeah, exactly. I you swear. Know you have those two. Uh, Micah, that uh, truer words can, you know, and, and let's not forget, you know, uh, that is that statement. I mean, we should make T-shirts, right? Yeah. But, but here's the thing. Don't forget the three of us go to a planet. There's going to be some kid running to his parents going, I just saw an alien. I swear, I swear to I do. It was, it was a flying. So we're the aliens. We're ET. <laughs> right? That's, oh man! It's uh, and, and what do we got to show for it? Ghost pepper ramen noodles. Ramen yeah, noodles. Okay, <laughs> that's Friday night right there in the can. It, it's every night. Um, <laughs> John is I thank you so much for supporting the channel. It says. So you and next week's guest host, I'm actually off next Friday, just putting it out there. Oh, and for the ramen wagon fund. Thank you. Ah, oh, John Asai, trying to weasel his way into being a guest host. All right. Yeah, I like, I like you know, that's called a trial close, a, suggest, a suggestive close. Well done. Like it, Billy Carson just got engaged, right? Uh, he and Elizabeth uh, yesterday or the day before, Micah. And, uh, and I'm already like, so who's the best man? What's going on? Uh, come on, hello. What's going on? You know, you know what's going on? I'm already, I'm already telling. You. Yeah, I'm taking the car for a test drive, <laughs> and uh, zero reaction out of Billy. Hey, I'm not going to be as bad, <laughs> but it's just really, really funny. You know, really funny. or really awkward. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh man, you know, there's a uh, uh, Christina. Uh, you, you know, you've been hanging out with us now for a year, year and a half and, uh, it flew by. I'll be honest with you. I was kind of surprised, but there is a, there's a, a circle of friends, uh, that we've been out there doing this thing, uh, for quite a while. And I got to tell you, we, we, we kid, we push, <laughs> we test each other's nerves. We know what buttons to push. And uh, and we do it because uh, we're all great friends and and we trust and and respect each other. So yeah, I absolutely went to Billy and said, "So yeah, cool, congratulations. Who's your, who's going to be your best man?" 
<laughs> just, just to push that button, man. So. You gotta do the wink. You gotta do the wink at the end, going like, "Who's gonna be your best man?" Huh? Wink. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So anyway, anyway, he's gonna text me in a second. Church, give it up, man. Just, just. <laughs> so we may get an update tonight, after all, huh? On something. Wasn't a UFO report, but you know. uh, by the by the way, um, I've had uh, I keep checking my phone. Uh, you know, I'm set up for Google alerts and uh, New York Times and L.A. Times and Wall Street okay. Journal for the report. Has, but nothing. I mean, you know, I get alerts. You know, like I'm, I'm I've been looking down and looking down. No, still nothing. I am I disappointed, but I you know what I have. I'm optimistic for it dropping next week. And okay, okay, what's the over under? What's the over under? Who announces it on Twitter first? The debrief or John Greenwald? What's the over under? What's the over under? You know what? I'll give this one to brother John. John is much more active on Twitter and he'll tell you that. Uh I in this day and and with all respect to John because I mean John will tell you. I mean, he has really made Twitter a thing for himself. Yeah. He's got a tremendous number of followers and and he gets that information out so that all of the rest of us can see it for my own part. I'm old school. I try to limit how much time I spend on social media, hence the TikTok thing. You know, I'm not on there. What I do is I don't worry about being the first. Uh, and I'll say that John Greenwald is definitely one of the best, but I, that's what I focus on doing. I, I worry about doing the very best that, I can do and helping direct my team to do our best, you know, okay. Julian Barnes has his opinions and I thought his report was great. Some of this other reporting, frankly, that I've seen in recent days ahead of this report dropping, we haven't even read it yet. And they're all, we have a, a source that tells us this, 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 and this, and that, and the other. And I'm like, what has this added to the conversation? Not, not, none of it. And, and you know what, can I, can I, can I just say something? Let me just, piss off the world do it go what, for it church what did what was why was julian barnes article even written I, why, you know why 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 would he got paid he got paid by the word for that and, and it said nothing it's literally what was the significant what was the importance why write that article uh, aside from, man, I got a car payment due this week. If I get this, I got to write something today. Let me get this in. I'm like, ah, I got to do, I got to do at least 8,000 words. Uh, Chrysler Capital is on my butt. That's well, the only reason that article got written because there was nothing in it. We'll give him this. We'll give him this. Zero nutritional value. New York Times has always tried to lead with reporting they try to do the best. They try to do um, the first. And it's hard to do that in this environment, even with it the is. extensive contacts that, you know, New York Times reporters have. Uh, but I, I have to credit that publication and its editors for being brave enough to accept a story by Ralph Blumenthal, Leslie Kane. And 100%. Kane. I'm not talking about Leslie and I'm not talking oh, yeah. about yeah. Ralph. I'm not talking about December 17th. I'm yeah. talking about... Uh, uh, last week, Julian Barnes, Friday, yeah, breaking story right before this UFO report is supposed to get released. I'm talking about that story. But you know, and what was the reason for it? There was nothing that were there was not one thing that was uh, retention deserving. Not 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 not, not nothing. There was nothing sure. in that and nothing in that story. 115.3 percent but in order to maintain that that precedent for being the ones who get that story out there first and who provide you know solid reporting you know what story out there first but you Not know friday there was no they, they didn't break anything on friday their story just, did go yeah last friday but here's the thing here's the thing to your point we didn't really learn anything. And so sometimes I think that it's important to recognize that being the first kid on the block with a new toy doesn't necessarily mean that you're always going to have 
that best toy and be the only one with it. And it certainly doesn't mean that being the first one to the finish line is necessarily being a winner. In the case of the New York Times the other day, I think we saw that, okay, yeah, they they met their precedent, their standard of being the first ones on the block, but they didn't really give us anything important. And I think in the days ahead, there are going to be other outlets. I won't name any outlets in particular, but maybe I have one or two in mind. There will be outlets that have waited to see what's in the report and they will have spoken to officials and they will have spoken to people and they will have gotten opinions and attitudes and ideas and processed this and furthermore allowed the readership of that report to have processed what they've seen. We're going to give you, I mean, or that, that publication, I mean, they'll give you analysis based on the actual report, not on conjecture and hearsay and sources that can't be named and all this sort of stuff. New York still- Times alert just came in. See, it says now it just came in. Hold on. It just, says, oh, Julian Barnes has been fired for writing bunk. Uh, <laughs> listen to it. Just came in now. Just came in now. No, 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 no. Look, look, I appreciate Julian for what he does. Uh, I think he's a solid reporter. It, there's a little bit of his own perspective that was evident in that article the other day. But in this case, I don't think that, you know, folks who are following this subject are necessarily going to be looking at the times in this case for the most complete reporting on this. You know, we got to an idea of what might be in a report that nobody's read yet. Let's wait until the report drops and then we'll analyze it. Mike, Micah, you're a journalist. And, and I realize that uh, we just ran over our time limit, but we're going to keep this going. This is, I, this is, I, I think it's a very, very important point. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm writing uh, Mr. Barnes a little bit hard here. But right now, he deserves a little bit of a wake-up call because that article, which was an opinion piece, opinion, wasn't based on fact, and is trying to mislead the public that um, all UFOs have been solved, there's nothing to the story, and, 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 and that's it, it's us, there's, there's no ET, and the, 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 this last five years has just been a load of crap. That's that's what the public, re- as they read this, you know, somebody's going to come back in after reading that article and go to their friend, the experiencer, or somebody that just saw something in the sky and go, you know what, the New York Times says that you're full of crap. That's what's wrong with Julian Barnes's words. You're, you're, the words are powerful and people read that and they interpolate, they interpret, you know, and you you can't do that. It's, it's dangerous. I was completely offended by that. I'm like, you know, I'm reading something, you know, from something as esteemed and as respected as the New York times. And I'm reading that and I'm like, this is, this is a load of crap. The, you know, this I, isn't this isn't right, and this is not fair. And people read, you know, don't think that people do not read it. They do, and it's not just our community. You know, it's others. And you go and you reinforce a, a belief system. You know, uh, people that have blinders on, right? You're not going to change their mind. Well, whatever it is, you're not going to do that. But certainly, with people uh, with blinders on, you can reinforce that belief system. You know, and that's the power of words. And and Julian Barnes, no, nah, I think there's a lesson to be learned here. And I hope, I hope, yeah, I hope he hears me. I try it's- to be dispassionate, you know, but I will say, without supposing that there's a story I want to hear, I kind of felt the same way reading the article. I mean, the the big takeaway was, is what I'm seeing with what I thought were intentional use of of particular terms early on in the article weather balloon space yep. aliens yep are these and the in, apparent intention behind the use of those terms and then later buried down in the article and yet we still can't solve all these and the nimitz case and others remain um you know unusual even though military officials are confident that there's not an ex you know exotic explanation for them despite the fact that they remain unidentified now again that's true that doesn't that's an opinion though that's an opinion that's yeah, not that's a fact that's an opinion the, the the data by itself only says one thing, Jimmy. It is that it is unidentified. Right. And again, based on the wording of the last report, which is why I'm eager to see this one before presupposing that this next report's going to be just a, you know a, a washout. The last report already said, you know, that other category may entail objects that exhibit advanced, uh, uh, you know, 
capabilities in terms of acceleration, flight, signature management, all these kinds of things. That ain't weather balloons, ladies and gentlemen. That ain't, atmospheric phenomenon. that ain't aerial trash and clutter. It may be advanced technologies in use by a foreign power, but I'm sorry. Russia is currently, uh, you know, very well possibly losing an attempt at invading Ukraine. And as we have seen, Ukraine had some very advanced drones, far more advanced than what Russia was using. If Russia had surveillance technologies, the likes of which what our military is reporting in these UAP cases, would we not be seeing that right now being played out in the skies over Ukraine? Ukraine's got some pretty advanced drones. Where are Russia's drones? Now, sure, China may have some. I don't doubt that they do. But does that explain all of these accounts? And so that's the problem. And yes, reading Julian's article, you're right, Jimmy, I read that into my own you know, thought process, I would say this article may be doing more harm than good in the sense that it is overplaying the obvious and it's downplaying the questions. The questions are the things we should be looking at, the genuine unidentifieds, whatever they may be without ascribing any kind of provenance to them. Let's you know, focus on those genuine mysteries. Yeah. And, and using those two words, right? Weather balloons, completely offensive in, in an opinion piece, in an editorial opinion piece. It's not breaking news. It wasn't any quotable sources. It wasn't any of that. It was just Julian Barnes needing to make a car payment. And, well, and, and I get that. I get that. But here's the thing. It's so insulting Julian Barnes standing next to me looking at the beer can UFO that's 500 feet tall and 300 feet wide with everybody else and 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 witness that you think he's going to turn to me and go dude that's a you know I'm, I'm sorry man that's a weather balloon <laughs> that, that's nothing it, it's it's an insult you know to me and and the people that were around me and the witnesses um, all over this planet that have seen stuff in the sky and you're going to turn around and dismiss it all with the power of the New York times. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, uh, that's it. I'm going to be very vocal about this. I hope somebody here tweets them sure. on the Elon Musk engine and says, you know what? Go check out what Jimmy church said today, you know, and, and hopefully he'll, he'll, he'll take a look back at himself and how did church know I had a car payment due? Yeah. How did he know that? <laughs> All right. Listen, um, guys, I've got a ton of work to do. Um, and, and Christina, thank you for letting Mike and I just rant. Uh, uh, like this, but we're all very, 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 very passionate, and I'm excited about this week. This is going to break. We're, we've got an election that uh, we're going to go through. Um, we've got this uh, report that is getting ready to get released. On Monday, my TV show premieres, Ooh. featuring... Micah Hanks. No, I don't know. Might do. I now, know. listen, Judge, would you let the poor girl talk? You, 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 you get off your soapbox. Let the poor girl host her show, okay? Honey, go ahead and talk, would you? <laughs> but, uh, well, let, 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 me, let me just say this while you're here, Jimmy. You say people are reading that article, right, by Julian Barnes. And maybe, maybe in the U.S., uh, ufo sphere but for me i think the time of like the the mainstream media on t tv and even on the internet is is coming to a close because now people are looking for alternative news sources and independent media outlets podcasters youtube youtubers and like i just i just think that especially for my age group social media is where they look for their news now i've never heard of julian so i don't classify him as an expert so i know that none of my college peers are reading that article either and i was on with ross coltart and um bryce zabel this week on need to know and it it was truly an interesting show and and i and i said the same thing that the influence on media is changing that's just me i i don't feel educated or enlightened by a lot of articles in the mainstream media with the exception of course of leslie kane and a select few others but for the most part i see the mainstream media as a lot of narrative and gaslighting it is that's that it 
It is that at times, you know. I, look, it is that at times. It's actually really. You gotta awesome read. Like you gotta read everything. I mean, you don't have to, you know. And Christina, of course, you know, you're already doing plenty of reading, you know, with regard to you know your work uh, and everything outside of what you do, the fine broadcast stuff that you do. Jimmy, you know, you and I, buddy, we're students of life. Uh, we spend probably most of our day reading. We read the good. We read the bad. We read the ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, he keeps talking about how I'm a journalist. What does Jimmy do? Jimmy gets on a microphone four nights a week and often more than that. And he's reporting on the stuff that's happening in this sphere and providing an outlet where previously in decades past, with the exception of late night radio, there was no such outlet. So, and you do that too, Christina. And yes, we do that. You know, with the debrief, we've taken a more traditional kind of, uh, well, I say print publication, but it's not really that, is it? You know, a welcome to the 21st century. But the point is, is we've taken a more traditional journalistic approach, but still trying to cover a lot of the same things that, Christina, you do with your show and Jimmy that you do with yours. Uh, and so, again, in whatever format it takes, it does require knowledge. But the beauty of the modern you know, era with, with the, all the saturation of media and information we do have the ability to choose. We do have the ability and the right to choose. But I do, you know, express to people, expose yourself to a lot of different kinds of things. You know, science, you know, if you can bear the politics, read about that, read about economics, read about, you know, nature, study a little bit of everything and get to know this world. Because while we're spending so much time speculating about alien life and all these kinds of things, there's an awful lot to be discovered right here on Earth. That's True. That's right. That is right. Christy, thank you so much. It says that article offended me too. We're trying to change the culture in our military. So experiencers will report sightings. That article was a backhand in that effort. Yeah, kind of like what you said, Jimmy. Yeah, Christy, good, thank yeah. you for yeah. supporting the channel. That is important. And just final point I'll make about that too. If you're going to use, you know, obviously charged language, knowing what the connotations with weather balloons, space alien and things like this are, Rather than saying extraterrestrial, rather than saying, you know, balloons perhaps used for surveillance. Again, there was a different way that it could have been worded. It seems evident that Barnes was playing up those old standard tropes that media did for decades. He was gaslighting. And it is. Where does that get us? Where has that gotten us in the past? I don't think that that's necessarily constructive at this point, at this stage of the argument. Let's have a real discussion. Let's not play the old same song and dance. That's what I saw in print the other day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and when when I were when I read it, it was at the end of the paragraph, right? Weather balloons, period. And I read that, and I was like, Barnes, what are you doing? You know, you've just you're now a canceled check, right? I, I, how am I going to take anything that you do in the future serious if this is how you're treating me and and the community and the world about this subject? And you're you're doing you know offhanded, offensive. Uh, if, you know, maybe he thought it was funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna put well, but again, military servicemen and women who experience these phenomena, let's say they are Chinese drones or whatever else, do you think they appreciate being told that everything that they've seen was a weather balloon and that it certainly wasn't a space alien? They're, they're probably thinking, first of all, let's leave balloons and aliens out of this. We saw something, this appeared to be. A, a, a challenge to us as aviators and in furtherance of national security interests, something we're concerned about. That kind of language did us little service. And so, again, if we want to end those stigmas to, to the point that was raised right there, excellent point. We can't have that kind of dialogue if our effort is going to try to be toward changing the stigmas that have prevailed for so long. And if we want to really lift those stigmas and we really want to further this dialogue, we've got to think carefully about how we frame our argument. Well said. That is well said. I think a great way to end today's show. Jimmy, Micah, thank you so much for doing the show with me. And just to kind of touch on, Micah, on, on what you said before, actually, we wrap it all up. I, in a sense, I, I now wonder if maybe he was prompted to write that, maybe in advance of a, of a bust with the UFO report. I don't know. I, I think that hearing you guys speak about this a little bit in more detail, that's kind of where my mind is going with that. Next time on Strange Weekly News with Church, Hanks, and Gomez. <laughs> you know, that'll have to be the update, I suppose. It's only yeah. speculation. We may never know. But again, my bottom line, I'm waiting until I actually read that report. 
I'm with you on that one. Guys, thank you so much. Micah, where can people find you online to follow your podcast and your all of your social media? Indeed, yes. I can be found on uh, online at micahanks.com. Uh, just search for my name, at Micah Hanks on Twitter. Uh, and of course, regular weekly reporting over there at thedebrief.org from the team, Tim, uh, I almost said Tim Benias, Tim McMillan, MJ Benias, Chris Plain, Chrissy Newton, uh, yours truly. We got a great team of people and we're always bringing news on these and other developments. Thank you. And Jimmy, where can people find you and your radio show? <laughs> JimmyChurchRadio.com. There you go. Just, I don't know. <laughs> Twitter. I, so well, the, all of their social I, media links are below in the description yeah, box. Yeah, you know, I um uh, uh yeah, but the debrief, the debrief.com, that's where I start off my morning every day. Every day. That's I, how you got to do it. I, I I start off right there. And then then it goes to my world. So, um everybody out there, you now know where I base my show on every night. I base it on the debrief and I steal all of my stuff from there. And if, if the debrief is having a bad day, you can tell fade to black is phoning it in that night. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. I can tell when Jimmy hasn't read the debrief because he's like, Micah, what are you doing tonight? I need you on the show. <laughs> How many times has that happened? Oh man, Micah, Micah, you're not texting me back. Well, that's an impression of me impersonating Jimmy. That was incredible. That was pretty cool. You guys was- behave and be well. Uh, have a great weekend. I'll call both of you later, and let's keep our fingers crossed. Let's get this report out there, and and uh, so we can all relax. All Thank right, you. everybody, have a great weekend. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Micah. All right. What a very interesting and fun dynamic today on Strange Weekly News. We got to hear all of the interesting speculations when it's coming, when it comes to this new UAP report. What are your thoughts on this? What are you expecting to see? Because at this point in time, we have no idea when we're going to receive it. I hope it's next week. My fingers are crossed because I'm, I'm already going down that slippery slope of of sadness now that I don't have the report in my hands. But let me know in the live chat. Let me know in the comments. Make sure to hit the notification bell on YouTube because now we are doing four shows a week on this channel and you do not want to miss any of them. That is it for today. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. 